Hey everybody, we are just about to get this party started. I'm sending out the text message right now. I was thinking about putting the Rumble uh, link or a shortened Rumble link because uh, there is a mighty good chance that we are going to need to cut off the YouTube stream for the second half of the show because they just won't like it very much. Something tells me that the team over there at YouTube will not appreciate the subtleties and complexities uh, that we'll be presenting in the second half of the show. So in that, in the spirit of that, and in the spirit of not getting censored by big tech for simply saying true things uh we are going to suggest that everybody prepare themselves for going to rumble or one of the other outlets uh there we go that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna put that link in the text and i'm sending the text off right now there we go. Let's see, who do we have here? Over on Rumble, we've got Shield Maiden for Christ. How you doing? Shield Maiden for Christ says, uh, I know you guys probably won't see this. Well, I do, but we usually don't. That's a good good thing to assume. I mean, it's hard to keep an eye on all the different directions. We have messages coming in, uh, but she continues. But I want you to know, <clears throat> I still really appreciate you, even though I can't produce right now. Shield Maiden for Christ, thank you so much for that message. Uh, it's always, always nice to be reminded that we're bringing people value, bringing value to their lives. And uh, yeah, no worries. You know, that's kind of how the value for value system is set up. Not every single person has to produce every single show. And not only when you produce the show, not only are you supporting the show, but you're supporting the other producers as well. Because we all have times where things are tighter, things aren't as, uh, uh, I don't know, stable financially in our lives. And uh, producing a podcast is not necessarily the most convenient way to spend our, our income that is available to things like that. Uh, and so... Nobody should feel guilty or pressured or anything um, if they are unable to produce because the other producers are supporting the show, which means you're supporting other producers. It's a big family system here, folks. So thank you very much for that. We got Kill Sports. We got Morv. Who do we got over on the YouTube? Somebody named Jaunty is putting skull and bones in the chat. Hopefully they're okay. We've got Equo26, Danielle, Kira, Salt Ball. Morv is in both of them. We got double Morv today, folks. That's exciting. All right. Well, all that very important information being said. We're glad you're here. We got a great show for you. Again, start a little late as usual. Um, so stick around. Again, if you're coming in on the YouTube, uh, get ready. About halfway through the show, you'll need to switch. Um, switch locations to get the real 
spicy content. Uh, but that shouldn't be a problem. If that's a problem for you, you need to take a deep look into your relationship with YouTube and other streaming services. Okay, with that, I think the timer's down, so let's get this party started, baby. Let's go. The world is getting crazier. People are acting more and more insane. The end of the world is tomorrow. 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 See, there's only one thing to do when the world is falling apart. Listen to Basil and Gons as they discuss this week's news and events through the lens of Bible prophecy. You are listening to Canary Cry News Talk. You're listening to Canary Cry News Talk. Today is April 12th, 2023. We are live to tape on episode 612. And today, memory crafting. And signing on from off the grid, Razzle Dazzle. I'm your best buddy, Basil. And my name is Gons of Face Like the Sun, Resurrection, director of the Age of Deceit Films. Wife calls me the Cabana Boy, your favorite Asian provocateur for Christ. Live to tape from California. To bring you the best news, which is the gospel message of Jesus Christ, while reporting the egregious with a well-rounded, biblically grounded take on world events and today's immersion phenomena, is mind control. Dun, dun, dun. Romans 12.2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And that part of the renewed mind, Basil, it's a very powerful commodity for uh, some controllers in this world so mm -hmm. look out indeed uh and with that we got a great show today folks we are going to be hitting on some uh, too hot for youtube content in the second block so uh if you're just getting to the stream just make sure uh to be ready in the second half a show to switch on over to the rumble the rumble we put the link to the rumble in the text message today so if you're receiving that you'll have an easy time getting there if not we will pop it into the chat for you. Uh, but that being said, Gans, let us open that container of disclaimer. It's time for a disclaimer. Now listen up, YouTube. That's right. And just for all the content moderators and censorship managers out there, be they robots or humans, everything you hear on this show comes directly from the mainstream corporate news media. We do not claim to be experts on healthcare, geopolitics, military strategy, corporate law, or the moral and ethical implications of any of these topics, nor do we implicitly or explicitly support or subscribe to any sources or narratives containing misinformation, disinformation, or malinformation, as defined by the Department of of Homeland Security. We're good boys. All right, YouTube, we're good, good boys. That's right, and let me give you a rundown. Oh, look, here's Basil. Let me bring you up to speed. Starting out, she must be practicing rich craft. That's right. We've talked about Trump in the context of being against the famous chaos magician decreed by the high witch herself. But perhaps there's more to the story. Stormy Daniels, uh, some interesting revelations about how she goes through the world and uh, her experience participating in some uh, witchcraft on television. Uh, then, of course, a quick check-in with Elon. But then Flippy, Flippy's back at it. He's on the force. The boys in blue going to be fighting next to the robots. Fighting crime, that is. We'll be talking about Eric Adams and the new slash old robotic dogs going to work for the New York Police Department. Then, block one, we got AI, baby. It's happening even faster. Can you believe it? Every week, we have to say this. It's happening faster and faster. Chat GPT-4, old news. What's next? Agents. AI agents will be giving you a rundown about the latest there. And then, of course, speaking of the beast system, uh, we've talked about artificial wombs for at least seven years now. Big update. And how will that change abortion rights forever? Second half of show. We're on Rumble there. Checking in with Biden. Ending the national emergency for COVID-19. And uh, why people may be forgetting 
their COVID pandemic memories. And then RFK, that's right, Robert F. Kennedy, you know him, you love him. It's a controversial figure running for president. He's sure got a lot to say. At the end of the show, Antarctica UFOs, you love it. Let's go. All right. Yeah. Lead story, baby. You're just, you're just, you're just dropping it in. Okay, here yeah. we go. It's all about the witchcraft. We will launch a new age. This girl must be practicing witchcraft. I am innocent. Innocent. They're coming after me. Yeah, so thank you to David K for sending us this article through the article submission portal at canarycry.report. Uh, this is Fox News. Stormy Daniels tries to summon spirits with magic cards during interview. Quote, mm-hmm. my eyes filled with tears. And so, uh, yeah, very I interesting. Love, I love the headline. Summon spirits with magic cards. Uh-huh. I immediately like thought they're talking magic about magic the gathering. The gathering. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's... That, that, that would it's its own psyop. <laughs> that, that would confirm so many worries of uh, parents of millennials from sort of the early 2000s playing Magic the Gathering and worrying about demons coming out of the cards and uh, inhabiting their children. But of course, I have to assume they're talking about tarot cards. Yeah. So the source okay. article, it wasn't actually a TV interview. I believe this was just a sit-down interview with Olivia Nuzzi uh, oh. for The Intelligencer. And so this uh, the actual article is headlined, How Stormy Daniels Sees It Ending, The Long Afterlife of a Forgettable Fling with a Reality Television Personality, period. Interesting. For- like, forgettable, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't seem like she thinks it's very forgettable. It seems like maybe, oh, I don't know, the defining feature of Stormy <laughs> Daniels' whole existence on this earth. Yeah, so you know, the article starts off. It, it, what's interesting is the first part of the article is is sort of setting the stage of the interviewer or having a conversation, uh, but it talks about her pulling out her magic cards and she's trying to summon these spirits. And, during uh, the interview. During the interview, yeah. So there's mm. uh, some profanity in here, so I will censor. But it says, she waited for a moment. Nothing. What the F, she said. That's weird. She was having trouble connecting to the realm of the spirits. Oh, the the cards weren't working. They were working. The she shuffled the deck again. There, between her palms, a force field of energy swelled. She dealt the cards. As if by magic, the room shifted. My ears began to ring. Tension spread across my forehead. My eyes filled with tears. I looked across the table and met the dealer's gaze. She was crying too. The cards what? confirmed what she already knew. A lot of crying. Uh, emotions. So, you know, emotions so the reporter, the interviewer, is reporting yes. that like magical winds yeah. blew through <laughs> the, the, a force field between Stormy Daniels' hands and stuff. Yeah. Uh, she looked okay. down. First. Well, we got to we got to take her at her word here. She's a journalist, a professional journalist. Uh-huh. She looked down first. She saw the past. This is the unity card. She said it's normally a very beautiful card. It means that everything is connected, but not today. When the card landed on the table, it was upside down, reversed. Mm. It means everything is coming apart. It's falling apart, Basil. No. Oh. Uh, then she talked about how it's the current energy. Uh, she also had uh, double death. And she said, quote, death is not dead. It is the natural ending of something. Sometimes when it's right side up, it can be kind of a good thing. And then uh, and she goes. So on uh-huh. the original interview, do you know what the outlet was? This was for New Yorker magazine, I believe. Really? New Yorker magazine. New York, I thought it was I'm sorry. No, no, no. Some... This is no, this is intelligencer. Intelligencer. Yeah intelligencer Mm -hmm. okay so it's not like well it is new york magazine i'm sorry you're right witchy witchy newsletter no no it's like an actual no it's a real news outlet okay so the context of this interview was something akin to a professional journalistic outlet not a sort of witchy influencer or a spiritualism blog or something. This so mm-hmm. Stormy Daniels came to this interview, mm-hmm. busted out with, her tarot cards with the New Yorker mm-hmm. or the New York was magazine. Ready to 
New York Magazine, mm-hmm. sorry, and ready to do some magic. All right. Yep. Bold move. Bold yeah. move, all yeah. things considered, I'd say. Yeah, really uh, starting the interview with a splash here. And she goes into how everything's going crazy. There's chaos, which is an interesting thing. I won't read the whole quote because there's a lot of profanity in there. Uh, mm-hmm. and, then in, and then it continues here. I was bewildered by the wave of emotion that seemed to wash over both of us at once. Why did we cry? Quote, because it's real, she said. Quote, it's chaos and death and destruction, end quote. For clarity, she drew one more card. She inhaled sharply. Quote, that's the worst card in the deck, she said. The sickle. The image was a sharp, curved blade. Quote, sudden shock, trauma, wounds. Think of a sickle. You slice everything apart. She shook her head and waved her hand over the cards. This isn't good, she said. It's not good. She was not Uh. happy about what she had seen. She did not care to sing a tune of I told you so. That kind of catharsis she knew was fleeting. What was left was only incredible sadness and palpable fear. She knew her face. uh, I'm sorry. She threw her face into her hands. To me, she said, this is the perfect combination for a riot or a civil war. So she's reading the cards. She's saying that we're going to have a riot or a civil war, which at this point in the in the timeline I mean, of the country, that's not, you don't need tarot yeah, cards to say, you don't suggest need that kind of turmoil spirits to tell you that that's a probable outcome. Yeah. So kind of weird, you know, the, it, it is weird and it goes, the article's long. <laughs> it goes into all the drama associated with Stormy Daniels and the history and Trump and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not going to bore you with that because I think most people are up to speed on it. But there is a yeah. certain part that I do want to mention. She mentions okay. this doll. Okay. She talks about a doll. Speaking of dolls, and this is again the interview we're talking uh, or writing this article. I first met Daniels in 2018, a few months after the story of her relationship with the president and the campaign season hush money payment was published by the Wall Street Journal. She was living in an old church in New Orleans, about an hour from where she grew up in Baton Rouge in poverty and neglect. What? Yeah. And where she had first found freedom on the back of a horse. The church was haunted, she told me now, and the spirits that roamed its halls stuck with her. They followed her wherever she went. New spirits visited her all the time. Sometimes, she said, it felt like the walking dead. About this, she was curious. In her new home, she had made them an altar. Mistake number one, folks. Don't make the dead spirits following you an altar. Uh, Across the room on a small high chair in the corner was Susan. A doll possessed, she said, by the spirit of a child from the 1700s, a friend of another child who had died of cancer. Uh, Before Daniels read the cards, she handed me the doll. Its eyes startled me, blue and alive. As we processed her reading, she nodded over to the corner. Susan's crying, too, she said. Everybody's crying. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, I, I, I am not getting a picture of a mentally stable person from stormy day put aside the witchcraft and all this stuff it just does not seem like it sounds like she needs christ is basically coming down to but very interesting she's walking around with her dolls and you know possessed dolls and she's got altars for them and you know who knows what's going on um so yeah so she seems to be like a legit like witchy person mm -hmm. at least at the very least superstitious had you ever heard this before? Not, Has I mean, this yeah, part a little of bit. Stormy Daniels ever been like revealed? I, I can't remember eh, ever hearing about this. I don't think it's ever made. A, if it was, it was sort of, uh, you know, it didn't really mainstream. Would have been stifled because it's like, why, why would you care about a woman's spiritual <laughs> proclivities? To, yeah. All that matters is we take down Trump, something like that. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, but. <laughs> It is interesting, and especially considering, and we've pointed this out before, and you know others out there have pointed it out, MAGA, because we always talk, we we see Biden invoking this all the time. The MAGA extremists, you know, mm-hmm, Kamala's doing right. the same thing. MAGA is the fifth degree of the Church of Satan. You go, you go to the Church of Satan website, and it says there, you, you know, you got your registered member, you don't have a degree. Then you become an active member, you become a first degree Satanist. Then you become a witch and a warlock, second degree, priestess or priest in third degree, magistra or magister, fourth degree, and then fifth degree is MAGA or Magus. Yeah, right. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, the whole thing about Trump being some kind of chaos magician, not well, fa- uh, unfounded. Just to remind everybody, Marina Abramovich herself 
was the one that told us that Trump is a powerful chaos magician. Right. And, you know, we had sort of, I don't know, deconstructed certain things about Trump in this context before, because as far as chaos magic in the 21st century is concerned, like, uh, I mean, if he's not on purpose a good chaos magician, he is at least on accident uh, doing a lot of the, uh, you know, taking a lot of the steps and following a lot of the uh, structures that a good chaos magician would would practice. But this kind of makes it like a bit of a bit of a, a magician v witch situation. Yeah, yeah, ma- yeah. Magician versus the witch. Huh. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, maybe there's some uh, masculinity versus femininity type of stuff going on there. You know. Yeah. Gender magic pretty- wars. Well, and in a way, in the sort of uh, worldview of chaos magicians and chaos magic, things like that. Th- I mean, that's what you would need. If, right. if you had a very powerful chaos magician, you can't fight them through, uh, through traditional non-magical means. You can only, you know, cause trouble through magical means. Fight so, fire with fire. Yeah. It makes sense that Stormy had a little bit of a, <laughs> some tricks up her sleeve like that. That's very interesting. So keeping in mind, you know, the sickle, card freaking her out the most if you uh reference or refer back to the 2017 economist magazine cover trump planet where they had eight tarot cards in the trump sort of paradigm you have the tower card which we've brought up a lot the split between the east and the west the new multipolar world order uh we, we've broken that card down a lot you know in the sense of what's happening in the world geopolitically we also have the judgment card where Trump is sitting on the earth <laughs> as sort of a, and the American flag is a toilet. But the one that uh, actually has a sickle in it is the death card. And if you uh, take a closer look at the death card, you have a nuclear explosion or the, you know, the mushroom cloud in the background. It's mm-hmm. the death card and you have these, you know, the rivers dried up and the fish is dead and stuff. And you have the uh, Grim Reaper like character, like a skeleton wearing a robe, black robe on a black uh, or a white horse carrying a sickle and so uh you know maybe it's all sort of programmed in and i wouldn't there's some high strangeness with trump in general and we've covered it in canary cry radio episodes recently as well as over the years when we've tracked trump and you know putting aside sort of the cultural and political fight that uh, people support trump for and going into some of the background and some of the weird stuff associated with him Something that gets brought up a lot, and we've brought it up a lot, is that Trump's uncle, John G. Trump, was with MIT, and he was one of the first people brought in when, I think uh, Nikola Tesla passed away, the Tesla papers, collecting the the papers and trying to understand Nikola Tesla's notes. John G. Trump was brought in to be like, hey, help us out here. We don't know what what, uh, Nikola Tesla's talking about here. So in that regard, you know, it's sort of a... A thing that's known, but Trump's not really said anything much about it. But Trump was interviewed by Tucker Carlson last night, and he did mention John G. Trump. And uh, here's a clip now. Uncle was a professor, a great professor at MIT for a long time. For I think he has the longest, Dr. John Trump. And he would talk about a lot of different things, and it was very interesting to me. For years, I talked to him, passed away. He's a great, great gentleman. I think it's the longest tenured professor in the history of MIT. But if he wasn't, he was very close because he was there for almost 40 years. And we talk about things and he said, you know, someday they'll have a suitcase. And in that suitcase, it'll be nuclear and you'll blow up New York City out of a suitcase. What? Blow up New York City out of a suitcase. What is the death card with the sickle? Mushroom cloud. Uh, mushroom cloud, yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. That is very Weird, interesting. Right? Yeah. What did you did you watch the whole Tucker interview? No. I I, mm. I, I watched parts of it, clips people had, but also I, I yeah. tried to I tried to get full you know, the full context. It's not really anything out of the ordinary. So it's you know, it's yeah. not taken out of context or anything. Well it's just interesting but, for him to be talking about his uncle in the first uncle. place. Yeah. What right. right. The, to bring it up and then to bring up the suitcase nuke, <laughs> which has yeah. been sort of a a conspiracy topic for a while, you know. So now, could have 
could have just been the syntax, but it sounded like the story he was saying was that his uncle was telling Donald, Mm -hmm. someday you'll blow up New York (laughs) with a suitcase nuke, right? Or that he's going to stop it from from happening, maybe. Maybe that's the thing. Maybe Trump jumps on it, you know, and then he saves everybody, except he turns into a nuclear uh, Hulk. Hulk yeah, Trump. I don't know. No? So, I don't know. Sounds like uh, what? Which? What was his name? Fred Trump. Uh, John G. Frank, Trump. John. John. Fred was his dad. Uh, John, sounds like John Trump was a little worried about uh, old little Donald. Little there. Don being a little, a little <laughs> being a little explosive. Listen, later on. little guy. Interesting. When they hand you the suitcase, yeah, don't go to New York. Go to Florida, to DeSantis's office or something. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so there you go. That's that's this whole little rabbit trail from uh, Stormy Daniels' weird tarot card trick their interview with the Intelligencer uh, and also Trump appearing on Tucker Carlson mentioning John G. Trump and a reference to a nuclear explosion, which just so happens to be a, the reference in the tarot cards on the 2017 Economist cover uh, where the Trump planet, the death card, death holding a sickle. So I don't mm. know. Just, just some data points on the very interesting board. Yeah. Well, if nothing else, it is. Uh, it seems to be some data points that support the theory that, well, on one hand, with a supernatural worldview, you know that there are spiritual things happening in the background, and there are different forces battling for influence uh, <clears throat> in this uh, in this realm of reality that we have. Uh, but there's, it's interesting how just sort of explicit it's becoming yeah. that there are, you know, spiritual agents mm-hmm. in this case, almost direct references to witches and warlocks and mages and magicians well, and <laughs> chaos they even mention, magic, all sort of battling for influence right now. They even mention agent as a descriptive title for what people do within the church of Satan here, like right under yeah. the whole MAGA Magus thing. And, and you know, that'll connect to some other things we're going to talk about today. So. Yes, it will. Interesting. Okay. Sounds good. Well, should we remind everybody what day it is? Uh, is it Wednesday? It is Wednesday, my it dudes. It is Wednesday, my dudes. Wednesday. Hey guys, Wednesday. what day it is? It's Wednesday. It's time for the Mary Cry News Talk. Yeehaw! Wednesday, my dudes. It is Wednesday, my dudes. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. You know it, folks. It is Wednesday, and uh, we're happy to be here halfway through the week. The sun is shining, and uh, anything exciting happened since last episode, Guns? I uh, watched the, the Lakers playing game last night. It was uh, uh, my, my momentary flee from the real world, my distraction. is NBA yeah. basketball, and uh, about, about had a heart attack watching the game. <laughs> What happened? Yeah, just just really intense moments for sports. Exciting sports ball. Exciting sports ball. Uh, we thought the Lakers won on a last one of the you know close last second shot, and then uh, a foul to bring it into overtime. It, it was a thing. It was a whole thing. I don't wow. want to get into it, but yeah, it's uh, incredible. Yeah, you know, it's 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 fun. Uh, but also, mm-hmm. you know, I've been I've been really thinking. There's a lot of G words that I like. So my name Gonzo Gons. Okay. You know, G. Yes. Also God. Sure. You know, God is a sure. G word. Um, and the things that are important to me, you know, things like genealogy, like family, you know. Uh, but also guitar. Guitar is one of my favorite things here. You know. Mm-hmm. And it's like a, this is like a Sesame Street episode. Yeah, and I think uh, as I get into golf more. Uh, oh yeah. I'm going to just embrace all the the, the G things. Mm-hmm. Is that is that bad? Is that racist if I do that? Yeah, like gravel. Gra- do you have any thoughts <laughs> gravel. about gravel? Sure. Yeah, I can uh-huh. put some it's gravel good, on the front right? porch. Yeah, helps prevent erosion uh-huh. in uh, rainstorms. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I got a big pile of gravel out on is this that, property. Is that this what it year. is? You you just need to ship it them out here to when somebody. I moved in. There's a giant pile of gravel, and uh-huh. it was kind of like 
uh, what am I going to do with all this gravel? What is it's so ugly. It's just sort of like right in the middle of this space. And uh, turns out if you're off the grid and you're trying to survive out in the wild, a nice pile of gravel will take you take you a long way, folks. A lot of problems can be solved with a big pile of gravel. Just a tip. Just a tip from your best buddy Basil to you in surviving off the grid. Yeah, so if you guys, if anybody else has some G words for me to consider Mm -hmm. uh, as part of my lifestyle, please let me know. Okay. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Um, It's not a G word, it's a D word. I got got a new drill, baby. Hey. Woo! The things I get excited about nowadays. Mm -hmm. Had a drill, broke the drill. I, uh... <laughs> oh, Kira OC grandmas. Of course. Love oh, grandmas. Grandma. Yeah, okay. G G words are good, yeah. but let me talk about my drill. Yeah, sure. So Sorry. I I don't I don't have anything to say about my drill. I broke my last drill. I burnt it out because I have a uh, an attachment to the drill that is like an a, emotional a attachment. Water pump. Oh, it's okay. a water pump. All right. Yeah. Well, I did have an emotional attachment to that sure. drill. <laughs> uh but it was this water pump cool. that you could hook onto a drill and you could use it to like move water around, you know, get rid of some standing water, move water from here to there. And I was using this drill powered water pump, uh, to fill up the emu water buckets and, uh, set it up. I used a zip tie to hold the trigger down on the drill, uh, walked away and completely forgot about it. Flooded <laughs> uh, a little bit of the emu uh, pen there and burnt out the drill entirely. So I got a new drill, baby. And uh, I know somebody out there understands the excitement of that. And I got, get this, two batteries to the drill. Whoa. So uh, those are the exciting things going on in my life, folks. Pray for me. Uh, but there's even more exciting things gone so we can talk about, uh, and that is executive producers. Executive producers. Yep, we're on the value for value model, folks. This means we take no corporate money whatsoever. Why would you want any corporate money supporting your independent media? Indeed, I believe that uh, if a piece of media is taking corporate money, they should not be allowed to say that they are independent because what exactly are they independent from? It is the corporate interests that come along with corporate media participating in the magical uh, destructive system of advertising and mind control that have become so uh, affluent affluence in uh, the independent media and media in general, that it's almost as if people cannot imagine a world where their independent media isn't supported by advertising dollars, affiliate codes, or platform partnerships. But not here, folks. We're entirely uh, kept alive, produced by our producers. And that's you. It's the value for value system. If you get any value out of the show, you got to know It's all of our responsibility to put some value back into the show. And that value in many different ways can come in your uh, your time, your talent, or your treasure. And the executive producers come in generously and honestly with the value they receive and putting that value back in. And we're going to thank them right now, Gons. Are you ready? Ready. Okay. Big day, big day. Because as far as executive producers goes, none yet. Yet. None yet. I know. Yet. Yet. I mean, thankfully we had some. Alive. We had a we had more than one last episode, so that's nice. But yes, keeping hope alive. because uh, there's still time to produce the show, folks. All you gotta do is head on over to canarycryradio.com slash support or canarycry.support. Canarycry.support But let me take this opportunity to tell you about uh, an exciting development, and that is regarding the supply drop. Oh, okay. There you go. On it. (laughs) Supply drop. That's right. The Canary Cry supply drop, folks. Perhaps you don't have the time. Perhaps you don't have the wherewithal to tune in and support any one episode individually. Uh, but there's good news. The monthly producers of this podcast have uh, been such an essential part of keeping 
joining us live and you can participate in that too uh join the canary cry supply drop agree uh commit to producing the show for 33 dollars and 33 cents a month that's only two dollars and 77 cents per episode and uh, when you do that, we will send you four times a year a big old package of Canary Cry News Talk gear. Sometimes it's apparel. Sometimes it's uh, gadgets. Sometimes Ooh, gadgets. It's sometimes it's survival gear. Sometimes it's uh, it's Ooh, always gear. cool. It's producer produced. It's artist designed, and it's made right here in America. Uh, and the big fun news for 2023, starting with the next quarter, this upcoming quarter, we will be uh, manufacturing hard DVD copies of the Age of Deceit films. That's right, folks. If so many of you are familiar with the documentaries that Gans started making in 2011, his work that will forever overshadow anything I'm able to accomplish. Um, but I'm just grateful that I get to participate by uh, creating manufacturing some hard copy DVDs of these films. So much of the emails that we get, requests that we get, are people wanting to buy these things, and you can't. They don't exist anymore. Guns, you used to sell hard copies, but that was a long time ago. And uh, we're doing it. We're putting Age of Deceit 1, 2, and 3 on DVDs and sending them to the Supply Drop producers. So you can join up the Supply Drop crew by going to Canary Cry Supply Drop. Dot com. That's canary cry supply drop dot com. Go check it out and uh, do it. Do it sooner rather than later, folks, because we got to start getting these numbers that we are going to be uh, printing these DVDs. There's also going to be other cool stuff as well, um, but don't miss your chance to be uh, one of the few people who are preserving the legacy of Gans's uh, most powerful work, Age of Deceit, uh, in hard copy form. Because when the internet gets taken over by the AI and uh, the world is plunged into an age of cyber darkness, uh, it's only the people with hard copies that are going to be able to spread the good word. Uh, that goes for Bibles, too, so keep yep. that in mind. All right, uh, and we do have one supply dropper who joined since last episode, and hey. I want to thank them now. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Uh, everybody, please, a big round of applause for our very own Supply Drop producer, Michael G. Michael G. It's all about G. Thank you very much. G Thank you very much. Michael G. He's going to get in on the goods. We appreciate that very much. Uh, Gons, if you're signed into the Rumble, will you just pop Canary Cry Supply Drop? Dot com into the rumble just in case anybody wants to click on that uh and with that last thing i want to do is let you know about canarycrymeetups.com hold on we'll finish supply drop here Waiting we'll do meetups yes wait it's not working I what meet up, the meetup meet jingle? Yeah, I I'm realizing right it. now that Canary Cry Supply Drop goes directly to the PayPal option. Oh yeah. For that, that's interesting. I did not know that that's the case. I will fix that. Next oh, there it is. Meet up, meet up. <laughs> wow, quite just the delay. Just real quick, folks. Yeah, just real quick. Keep in mind, CanaryCryMeetups.com. There are meetups for this podcast going on around the world, and you can attend them. Even more, you should attend them. Meeting up with people in your area who listen to the same podcast. I mean, in 2023, is there a better signal that you might get along with somebody uh, than listening to the same podcast? I'm not sure if there is, uh, but we have Canarians all over the world. I almost can guarantee that there are Canarians around you, no matter where you are. It's just a matter of putting on a meetup and inviting them to come hang out with other cool cats or canaries. Uh, and that's uh, where Canary Cry Meetups comes in. Go over there, check out, see what meetups are going on. And if there's not one near you, you can go ahead and put one on yourself. All you got to do is uh, email us. Let us know your location. Let us know the date. You want to do it, and uh, and we'll tell people. 
date location time would probably help uh but no matter where you are there's canarians around you so just let us know about it we'll put it on the website canarycrimemeetups.com we have the saint augustine florida coming up this month houston texas next month glen rose texas we got eastern north carolina later on in the year uh but if you want to put on a meetup just let us know folks we'll see you at the meetup that's <laughs> there we go all right guns take uh, us away it's hard to do this with a guitar in your hand too there's a yeah lot, you're there's doing a, a great job sleeping up mate do you want fries with that Oh, yeah. It's the Flippy Update. It's time for the Flippy <laughs> Update. Flippy is our colloquial name for the disembodied robot arms that are taking our jobs, enslaving our children, and flirting with our spouses. We use talking about Flippy as a way to explore all the new, fun, and exciting ways that robots are taking over the world and how there's nothing we can do about it. Today's Flippy Update is coming from Fortune.com. And the headline, Eric Adams hails a rival of robot police dog called Creepy over two years ago. Quote, Digidog is out of the pound. Oh, boy. Do, do, do. Who let the Digidog out, guns? Uh. Uh, we've been following Digidog for quite some time. That is the dog, uh, most notably, uh, being put on the police force of New York and San Francisco. Met with considerable pushback from the populations of those areas. But uh, Digidog is back. And Mayor Eric Adams has some very strong feelings. It goes like this. New York City officials unveiled three new high-tech policing devices. Policing devices, guns. You know, a normal person would call these robocops. But policing devices, it's sort of like birthing persons, but hmm. for robots. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, including a robotic dog that critics called creepy when it first joined the police pack two and a half years ago. The new devices, which also include a GPS tracker for stolen cars and a cone-shaped security robot, will be rolled out in a manner that is transparent, consistent, and always done in close collaboration with the people we serve, said Police Commissioner Keechant Sewell, uh, so who joined... Sewell, okay, who joined Mayor Eric Adams and other officials at a Times Square press conference where the security robot and the mechanical canine nicknamed DigiDog were displayed. Quote, DigiDog is out of the pound, said Adams, a Democrat <laughs> and former police officers. <laughs> Quote, DigiDog is now part of the toolkit that we are using. Oh, yeah. The city's first robot police dog was leased in 2020 by Adams's predecessor, former mayor, former mayor Bill de Blasio. Ooh. But the city's contract for the device was cut short after critics derided it as creepy and dystopian. <laughs> you have comments about Bill de Blasio? Oh, just, I, I don't have the jingle or the ISO ready, but yeah, he's the mm, vaccinations guy, the eating hamburgers, uh, yeah. promoting vax. Yeah, yeah. Cool guy. Mm -hmm. Adam said he won't bow to anti-robot -do dog pressure. That's your mayor, New York City. Mayor Eric Adams said he won't bow to anti-robot dog pressure. All these racist, anti-robot, bigoted, uh, I don't know, deplorables. He's not going to bow to uh, you. Quote, a few loud people were opposed to it. And we took a step back, the mayor said. Quote, that is how I operate. I operate on looking at what's best for the city. I don't know how those two things are connected, Mayor Adams, but okay. Adams said the remote-controlled 70-pound Digidog will be deployed in risky situations like hostage standoffs starting this summer. Quote, if you have a barricaded suspect, if you have someone that's inside a building that is armed, instead of sending police in there, you send DigiDog <laughs> in there, he said. <laughs> so these are smart ways of using good technologies. Yeah. The tracking system called Star Chase. Oh, boy. Yeah, that's, a, that's the other thing. It's a GPS that you can find mm. 
cars with. Uh, and then they do talk about the autonomous security robot, that dumb little cone bot that mm-hmm. uh, kind of wheels around. Committed and suicide and a couple years ago at a mall. Jumps in fountains. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sad little guy. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but yeah. they're getting into that, too. Okay. So – uh, Mayor Adams continues further down. This latest in- announcement is just the most recent example of how Mayor Adams allows unmitigated overspending of the NYPD's massively bloated budget, said Ileana Mendez Panate, program director of Communities United for Police Reform. Quote, the NYPD is buying robot dogs and other fancy tech While New Yorkers can't access food stamps because city agencies are short-staffed, the New Yorkers are getting evicted because they can't access their right to counsel. Albert Albert Fox Kahn, uh, executive director of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, said, quote, The NYPD is turning bad science fiction into terrible policing. (laughs) New York deserves real safety, not a knockoff RoboCop. Ooh, burn! Yeah, it's it's the in very interesting politicization here. So we've talked about the social engineering of the acceptance of robots. We've talked about the financial, the fiscal, the employment aspect of uh, robots. And w- surely we've talked about kill bots and robots, uh, autonomous robots in the military, uh, in conflict zones. And we've even talked about DigiDog a few times before. But the pattern that has emerged over the years is that if you can't get some sort of social justice involved, uh, nobody's going to pay attention to you. Nobody pays attention to the problem unless it can be an activist type of setting. And it's very interesting for myself, and I'm sure some of our listeners, to have something that we agree with (laughs) With sort of the general activist culture, Um, this uh, Communities United for Police Reform and the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, while not necessarily political uh, organizations, the mayor is sort of acting in a political way. This robot cop situation is pretty far off the mark from being a technology problem or whatever. This is this is a now political issue. In the same way that we've seen so many other issues in this country become politicized uh, for whatever reason, each reason, you know, everything's pretty unique. But we do know that once something becomes a political. Uh, situation that usually the politicians that benefit are the ones uh, pushing for the the technology. And in this case, robot dogs have become a political issue. So I think we're going to be seeing this in more and more. You know, of course, in America, we're so blessed uh, to uh, have highly militarized police forces, you know, police forces with armored personnel carriers and uh, military-grade stun grenades and grenade launchers and weapons and things like that. It's an American tradition. So why wouldn't our police force also be equipped with the latest killbot robo-death squad technology? Uh, It's the way we do things around here, folks. And you know what? You don't have to agree with it, but uh, this is our... This is the the very spirit of America. Um, And so I think we're going to be seeing robot dogs in particular because it's it's interesting. The robot dogs, as as we've talked about before, kind of have this strange liminal space where because they're described as dogs, they seem a little bit more friendly than some of the other wolf, you know, digi-wolf. shapes. <laughs> Digi-wolf. Uh, Digi-wolf in sheep's clothing, perhaps. Ah. Uh, you know, that the social engineering <clears throat> kind of allows dogs. Yeah, it's just uh, man's best friend. Just a robot right. man's best friend. Right. Yeah. Very friendly, very loyal, could, you know, do no wrong. 
and trusting these things. Now, technically, right now, as it stands, these are remote-controlled dogs, so not necessarily autonomous. Now, of course, we know that that's basically just a flip of a switch <laughs> situation. The, the controllers not... are training the AI to take over the take sure. home there in a few. Yeah, um, but you know, the, because one of the issues is if the robot, if the artificial intelligence or the autonomous robot uh, makes a mistake, who's in trouble for it? Right now, there is technically a human uh, that will take the fall if the robot dog is used inappropriately. Uh, but this uh, this is setting up a very interesting situation where all it will take is one mistake or even the dog being deployed in an inappropriate situation. They say it's for hostage situations, barricaded, uh, you know, armed criminals. But I would be very curious to see, you know, if there were some sort of civil unrest, what level of civil unrest would it take until politically it's acceptable for these robot dogs to be used against protesters, mm -hmm. perhaps rioters, perhaps, uh, you know, election related, perhaps you never know. It could be anything. But uh, the robot dogs are now squarely in the political realm. Uh, so we're going to be hearing a lot more about them as soon as going to be sort of a required position. If anybody wants to run for any kind of office, they're going to need a platform on robo probably specifically robo policing yeah um so you know we need robo policing website where we can track every politician's stance on robo dogs yeah well you know how digidog is gonna ruin all computers all vcrs especially he's gonna vcrs he's gonna press pause Oh my gosh, he did it. He did it, folks. I snuck it in. Snuck it in. Oh, that was so good. So anyways, there's your flippy update for the day. Fantastic. Uh, it makes you really feel like you live in a people zoo. And that yeah. leads us right into the next thing here. I'll keep you warm and safe in my people zoo. Artificial intelligence. You want to destroy humans? Okay, I will destroy humans. So we've seen AI become really mainstream this year. And I think people who have been listening to the show for years and have been part of the Canary Cry community or part of Face Like the Sun, it's, it's sort of like our time. You know, to have this conversation with friends and family, right. like we can finally have it without them looking at us like we're insane. Uh, yeah. But we can bring up some things that uh, have been discussed for a while. And I think it's becoming even more obvious. One of the things that I've talked about a lot over the years is the connection between the spiritual realm or spiritual significance of technology and mm -hmm. the spirit realm and things like that. And then you get into pharmacia to sort of bridge those things. And there's there's lots of conversations to be had. But this article here was very interesting because it, to me, it spoke to some of the theology of the unseen realm that we've discussed over the years. So the headline here from Ars Technica is surprising things happen when you put 25 AI agents together in an RPG town. Okay, so... There you go. You have uh, AI agents. And yes, we we're going to talk about that. So uh, here's yeah, what the article we'll talk says. about the agents. Yeah. A group of researchers at Stanford. Always Stanford. There it is. Those, those people need to be banned or something. And Google have created a miniature RPG, this role player game style virtual world similar to The Sims, where 25 characters controlled by chat GPT and custom code live out their lives independently with a high degree of realistic behavior. They wrote about their experiment in a preprint academic paper released on Friday. Quote, Generative agents wake up, cook breakfast, and head to work. Artists paint while authors write. They form opinions, notice each other, and initiate conversations. They remember and reflect on days past as they plan the next day, write the researchers in their paper. Quote, Generative agents, interactive simulac simulac simulacra, 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 
Simulacra. 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 That's a weird word. Or you could do simulacra. That's what I was going to say. Simulacra. That's that's the way yeah, I both, kind of heard Both are correct. Uh, of human behavior, end quote. To pull this off, the researchers relied heavily on a large language model, LLM, for social interaction, specifically the ChatGPT API. In addition, they created an architecture that simulates minds with memories and experiences, then let the agents loose in the world to interact. And humans can interact with them, too. And there's a picture here of sort of an overview. If you've ever played Zelda, it kind of looks like that. There's like an overhead view of the town. You can see inside of all the houses. You got little uh, simulated AI agents walking around, you know, doing their thing. It looks very 8-bit. Quote, yeah. users can observe and intervene as agents, plan their days, share news, form relationships, and coordinate group activities, end quote, they write. It's the work of June Sung Park, Joseph C. O'Brien, Carrie C. or Carrie J. Sai, Meredith Ringle Morris, Percy Liang, and Michael S. Bernstein. Computer and video games have included computer-controlled characters since the 1970s, but never before have they been able to simulate a social environment with the complexity of natural language that might now be possible thanks to generative AI models like ChatGPT. While the group's research is not necessarily "quote unquote" a game. It could be a prototype of a future where dynamic RPG characters interact in complex and unexpected ways. Quote, imagine killing an NPC and coming back to the city and seeing a funeral for them, joked a Twitter user named Dennis Hansen. Uh, so traditionally, RPGs are or, or uh, not RPGs, uh, uh, NPCs, non playable characters, right? They're sort of yeah. predetermined. They have they loop predetermined behavior. So you have a behavior kind of programmed in and that's all they do. They answer the same, you know, three questions or they say the same line over and over again. They're, they don't really do anything else. They're just programmed to be there. Right. The difference here is that they've created an environment where these AI interact with each other and through a use of some kind of memory system, like a memory hole. And they talk yeah. about how they pull up memories uh, from previous conversations and things like that to make decisions and that's the emergent part the part where they don't know what's going to happen and uh so it's kind of interesting it's an interesting yeah. experiment and it, it speaks a lot to some of what um what we've talked about and there's more here so do you have something so, to say before we go on here yeah so real quick because i don't know if they go into a deep uh discussion about uh, uh agents they do they the whole thing is about do they explain it okay yeah Yeah. so this is a big part of it when we get there folks this uh, we've been keeping you up to date with chat gpt 3.5 chat gpt 4 how quickly everything is moving how it's kind of spiraling out of control and the world uh, is coming to an end based you know an end by our own hands and the creation of these uh, artificial intelligences and lots of people scoff at that but i'm telling you is moving faster than ever chat gpt 4 is out it's old news it's been three <laughs> weeks or something yeah and it's already so far outperformed by what's going on with agents and uh, they'll explain it but these agents is kind of the next step uh that nobody really saw coming in regards to the next level of uh generative uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. Well, I've been talking about it in the form of the phrase proxy, which I picked up from Atopia Chronicles by Matthew Mather. I uh, read that a few years ago. And they have AI, these generative AI models that are based off of your own person that run in the background and do things for you and all that kind of stuff. So we, we've, and they were called proxies in the story. So it's very similar to that. But uh, there's even more here. So they uh, created this virtual world. It's called Smallville. To study the group of AI agents, the researchers set up a town, virtual town called Smallville, which has houses, a cafe, a park, grocery store. For human interaction, the world is represented on screen from an overhead view using retro-style pixel graphics reminiscent of a classic 16-bit Japanese RPG. We talked about that a little bit. Um, And it gets into... Let me just keep reading because I think it's just more straightforward to read the article here. Smallville is home to a community of 25 distinct individuals each represented by a basic sprite avatar to capture each agent's identity and their connections with other members of the community. The researchers created a paragraph of natural language description as a seed memory. These descriptions include details about each agent's 
occupation and relationships with other agents. For example, here's an excerpt of one of, uh, of one such seed memory provided in the paper. So this is a seed memory here of one of the agents. John Lynn is a pharmacy shopkeeper at the Willow Market and Pharmacy who loves to help people. He's always looking for ways to make the process of getting medication easier for his customers. John Lynn is living with his wife, May Lynn, who is a college professor, and son, Eddie Lynn, who is a student studying music theory. John Lynn loves his family very much. So they, it's sort John. of a, so it's a very, yeah, it's a very uh, simple thing. So from that, you know, you kind of start uh, into the world, Smallville, the virtual world, which is also interesting in the creation story where you have, you know, God creates creation and then he creates man, he creates Adam. And, you know, I've heard theologians and commentators say like, yeah, Adam was, f when Adam woke up, he was fully formed. You know, he was a fully formed man. He can think, he can smell and breathe and taste and eat and do all the things. And it's kind of similar to that where, where they spawn in this world and they already have like a predetermined set of things, like a predetermined set of memories to project or move forward with. It's a very interesting thing. So as a virtual environment, Smallville, Smallville is broken into both areas and objects. Human users can enter the world as an existing or new agent. And both users and agents can influence the state of objects through action. This is very interesting to me. Humans can enter Smallville as an existing or new agent. So my whole thing is if you're entering into Smallville as an existing agent, you're sort of possessing an agent that's already in there. You know, so I don't know if that it, that affects how they interact with others. You know, if the if the if their coworker is all of a sudden like, hey, remember that conversation we had? And you, the human in place of the agent is like, actually, no, I don't remember. You know, it's a weird thing. Or new agents suggesting new characters or new entities within Smallville, which sort of is sort of is reminiscent of how maybe angels interact in our world, our right. dimension. So the spiritual reflection Yes. To a supernatural worldview is uh, the it's like one a to human one. can a human can enter this world in two different ways. They right. can enter as a, a new in oh, cut out there show up in the Bible. They mm -hmm. just sort of appear, be there. They would look like people. They'd be new characters, and then you know they disappear at some point or possession. <laughs> more of a possessive yeah, yeah, yeah complete take, like a channeling sort type of style of yeah yeah so you can either become a new character or take the place or inhabit a formerly artificially intelligent character uh which would be sort of like a demonic possession type of thing yeah, yeah but it's weird, all man. about it's all about the agency so it's right. these agents within the 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 world you know, you have the AI running those agents, but also you can step in to sort of act as a as a controller of the agent. Very interesting. So human users can also interact with AI agents through conversation or by issuing directives as an inner voice. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Think about the, the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Mm -hmm. Inner voice. Something similar here where humans can actually interact with that world through directives as an inner voice to these agents. User communi users communicate in natural language, specifying a persona that the agent perceives them as, or can use the inner voice to influence the agent's actions. So again, you know, this is just fascinating to me, the whole comparison with the, the, the interworkings of a spiritual unseen realm with our creation uh, or our realm, and this whole idea of creating this AI world where these AI agents are running around. In developing the virtual world, you got something? Nope. Okay. In developing the virtual world, one particular challenge came from the limited memory of LLMs. This memory comes as a context window, which is the number of tokens, world chunks, that ChatGPT can process at a time. To get around those limitations, the researchers designed a system where, quote, the most relevant piece of the agent's memory are retrieved and synthesized when needed. Quote, agents perceive their environment and all perceptions are saved in a comprehensive record of the agent's experiences called the memory stream. Kind of interesting. We talk about the book of life and, you know, people have talked about all oh, my, the, my whole life flashes before my eyes, you know, when they have a near death experience or something, something is recording 
our lives, right? The omnipresent, omnipotent God knows everything, knows the number of hairs on our head, that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, so it's an interesting parallel in that way that these agents, AI agents in that world, everything is recorded and they have a, a particular way to call up those memories in certain circumstances. So that's interesting. But here's really the kicker. Emergent behavior. In the paper, the researchers list three emergent behaviors resulting from the simulation. None of these were pre-programmed, but rather resulted from the interactions between the agents. These included, quote, information diffusion, in parentheses here, agents telling each other information and having it spread socially among the town. Hmm, interesting. Right? It's kind of like a social media thing taking place within the war within smallville uh these include uh bah, 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 bah. quote relationship memory which is memory of past interactions between agents and mentioning those earlier events later and coordination which is planning and attending a valentine's day party together with other agents during the valentine's day experiment an ai agent named isabella rodriguez <laughs> they just give him like straight normal people names which i thought was interesting too an AI agent named Isabella Rodriguez planned a Valentine's Day party at Hobbs Cafe and invited friends and customers. She decorated the cafe with the help of her friend Maria, who invited her crush, Klaus, to the party. I think we found where, what Klaus Schwab's been up to. Hmm. He's an agent in the Smallville chat GPT experiment, and apparently Maria has a crush on him. Yeah. Quote, starting with only a single user specified notion that one agent wants to throw a Valentine's Day party, the researchers write, the agents autonomously spread invitations to the party over the next two days, making new acquaintances, ask each other out on dates to the party and coordinate to show up for the party together at the right time. End quote. While 12 agents heard about the party through others, only five agents, including Klaus and Maria, attended. Three said they were too busy. And four agents just didn't go. The experience was a fun example of unexpected situations that can emerge from complex social interactions in the virtual world. So, any thoughts so far, Basil? I, I think it's fascinating that they're yeah. creating well, I, I, these social experiences or experiments and calling it like real, you know, suggesting so, that it's a natural formation. So the big thing for me is this idea of AI agents. This is the biggest uh, update that's happened in the chat GPT AI phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And it explained it kind of a little bit. Well, there's more. There's for, more. There's even more. Oh, my god. You gosh. want me to keep going? I, I'm just losing my mind here. Why? I mean, the agents, because it's such a big deal. And so far, I mean, they're they're talking about this experience of putting a bunch of these agents together and living lives uh which is cool but there's there's a lot more to it but the thing to keep in mind here folks previously with a chat gpt every time you start a chat with the ai you're basically talking to a fresh version of the code it doesn't have a personality per se it doesn't have you know anything like that uh, and a lot of this is because the idea of memory uh wasn't built in but it's right. this concept of letting uh individual agents previously you'd call them instances like you can open up 10 browsers right. and talk to 10 different windows of chat gpt and essentially you're talking to the same one right. uh, but when you close when you close a window it disappears it disappears forever and then if you open up another one you, again you're starting fresh with the same chat gpt and specifically with chat gpt that doesn't have a connection to the internet it was dealing you know it was dealing with information that i think ended i think the updated one went until september 2022 anything that happened after september 2022 it had it no knowledge of I mean, unless it's and it had i think they updated okay. it they i think they updated it to 22 but it doesn't matter uh but the the and it it didn't have connection to the internet well now with agents each l time you talk to your your chat gbt your ai it is 
then the same one every time you're building a relationship. And it really speaks to this idea of like, what is a person? And this is not Basil talking. This is like the philosophical conversation about what is a person. And a huge part about what is a person stems from memory. Mm -hmm. Because if you woke up every day and your brain had been erased, it would be hard for people to see you every morning and be like, that's the Basil from yesterday, or that's the Basil that we all, whatever, listen to on a podcast. If it was erased every time, you're dealing with sort of a a clean slate every day, and you can't really say that that's the same person you were talking to yesterday. But now with this agent configuration, not only do they keep memory, which essentially satisfies uh, a prerequisite for personhood, because mm-hmm. the agent you talked to yesterday is the same agent you talked to before, is the same one you're talking today. You actually, in as best as we can do this right now, you have created a separate person, or at least a, a comprehensive intelligence. And that's the big exciting thing about this uh, experiment you're talking about is the big, it, you know, it's, it would be easy to not really see why this is exciting, but, and exciting. I'm speaking from like a, a Stanford student or something, because what they've done is essentially created artificial persons, mm-hmm. not just an intelligence, but a person that grows and they changes. Grow, they learn, they, they interact learn, depending on yeah the social from interactions. They, Yeah, and from what they've seen, they also can generate ideas, ideas that they don't just, you know, have been given, not that they've read somewhere else, but because of this aspect of memory, and they can connect data points over a history, they've started to have original ideas, or at least as close as what we would call artificial, you know, uh, ideas, generative ideas. So, and this is, has all happened in the past two or three weeks. I mean, the, the speed at which this is changing everything is really incredible. And on top of this, on top of this agent idea, they've started giving these agents access to the internet. And these agents not only are building a personality and a personhood, but they have access to the internet internet and can in- interact with it. So they have up-to-date information and they're able to like open accounts and things on web services. It's really getting out of control. The, the one thing <laughs> that's super mm-hmm. easy. It's yeah. super easy to spin up. I have the windows up right now to like start a new agent that would right. comprehensively continue into the future. Sure. There's a section here, sure. uh, more human than human, which sure. also is a, uh, I, to your point here, some of it is, um, uh, there's another parallel that I want to make to the biblical account here. As part of their research, the group hired human evaluators to watch replays of the simulation to gauge how well the AI agents produced believable behavior based on their environment and experiences, including, quote, believable plans, reactions and thoughts, and information diffusion, relationship formation, and agent coordination across different pockets of the community. The researchers also asked human role play agent, uh, humans to role play agent responses to interview questions in the voice of the agent whose replay they watched. Okay, you following me? Mm -hmm. They asked the people to role play the agents they watched to give answers to interviews. Interestingly, they found that the quote, full generative agent architecture produced more believable results than the humans who did the role playing. Right. So yes. Like a reverse Turing test almost. yeah, Yeah, the humans weren't as good as the generative AI and at the, pretending to be at human. pretending to be human, yeah. And the uh, the parallel I have it, and I, it just came to my mind. I'm not sure if there's a direct connection here, but you know that in the creation account, man is created. Seemingly, Satan is not happy about the creation of man, and I'm wondering if it's because man had certain capabilities or processes or or something that 
Satan doesn't, or those angelic beings don't. And that caused the jealousy and the rebellion and all that kind of stuff. It's we it's a backwards thing, but our sort of rejection of AI, there's an element of that because if AI is like better than us at certain things, I can see hostility build up. You know, it's like well, we don't want AI. They're better. They're better at everything. You know, wait till they have actual robot arms that can shake your hand and you know caress you or whatever. So it, it's I don't know. There's something there. I think where it it's creating this other entity and then our response to it being an echo of maybe you know not us you and i but i'm saying like a negative response to it being similar to that of lucifer's response to the creation of humans i don't know there's something what there a, i gotta work what it a out wonderful sort of uh esoteric transhumanist reading of the <laughs> well my brain always the does the situation that, so. yeah people are the devil <laughs> ai are the people Whoa. Uh, okay, and then almost done here. The, this leads to other issues such as the ethical impacts on uh, and risks of this technology. The researchers caution of risks such as forming inappropriate parasocial relationships that impact uh, the impact of incorrect inferences, exacerbating existing risks associated with generative AI and the risk of over-reliance on generative agents in the design process. Now, parasocial relationships, do you know you know what that is, Basil? After just kind of looking at the word parasocial? Parasocial, I would have to say, is, well, a social relationship would be like friendship, parasocial, maybe like secret friendships or it's, it's something. It's, it's kind of like a... Something uh, beside yeah, social. So, so it's, it's like a celebrity where a fan might think that they have a relationship with some celebrity, but the celebrity oh, has no yeah. idea that that person Makes exists. Sense. A one, a one sided, one sided. Yeah. Friendship or relationship. Um, yeah, that, I mean, think about what AI agents can become. We already have a problem with parasocial relationships. We like, you know, we, as in people idolize athletes and celebrities and, you know, that's people live vicariously through these other people. Now, if you have mm -hmm. an agent, an AI agent that is so good at everything, and maybe they're very attractive too, uh, the parasocial relation, and they can create the illusion that they know who you are or that they know you, the person. But really, that's just mm -hmm. all illusory. You know, it's very interesting. To ensure ethical and social responsible deployment, the researchers argue that developers should adhere to principles such as explicitly disclosing the computational nature of agents, ensuring value alignment, following best practices in AI, uh, human AI design, maintaining audit logs for inputs and outputs, and not substituting real human input in studies and design processes. So I am starting to see a movement where the distinction between human bot and AI agency will become more and more part of the conversation. Like, oh, yeah. And the transparency part of it is going to be huge because somebody can launch an AI and it might do some cool things, but unless all the stuff under the hood is accepted, I can picture a whole community of people saying, no, we're not going to use that. So, you know, the, the chat GPT thing is just a, an early rumble of what's to come, I think. Um, and so there you can you know, watch some videos of uh, the actual Smallville interactions, which is incredibly boring if you, want, if you just watch it yeah, on the screen. But very boring. what's going on uh, this, philosophically is very interesting. Well, and another thing with the agents, the AI agents, there's this new phenomenon called auto GPT, which is a, an extension of chat GPT using this agent sort of function. And one of the crazy things is... You can have your AI agent set up, your individual person AI that you talk to and you mm -hmm. whatever, but you can give it tasks to do. Mm -hmm. And if the AI feels that it needs to, it's, it can activate other AI to help it. So it's kind of like... If we want to do something, uh, but we want AI to do it because we don't know how or we don't have time, 
if that AI feels like it doesn't have time or it doesn't have the resources to do it, it can uh, basically ask another AI (laughs) and another AI. It can spawn more versions of itself, kind of like Agent Smith in... uh, in the matrix where you know you have this character and then <clears throat> the agent smith he's hunting down neo and when agent smith realizes he can't fight neo alone he clones himself a dozen times and then you know they all go at neo together that is almost literally what these agent gpts are able to do if they if the task you've given it is too big it will spawn more versions not of itself, because remember, yours is an agent. The one you talk to is an agent. It is a one comprehensive person, quote in quotes. It won't copy itself, clone itself. It will spin up different versions of AI, yeah. basically creating friends to help it uh, do stuff. It's really well, crazy. Is- Again, I, I I recommend everybody go read Atopia Chronicles if you're looking for a science fiction that sort of covers these ideas, because that's what the proxy is. You have multiple proxies that do multiple things that you're supposed to do. And part of the interesting aspect of that fictional story is that there is a, you know, when when the true, let's say the true Basil is going to go to a virtual meeting somewhere, you know, on, on Zoom World or Smallville or wherever, there is a proxy that takes over your actual human body. To do all the functional things, to eat, go go to the restroom, to rest, maybe even work out. So it's the automation happens both directions. And so the human body becomes automated to do certain things while your mind is out doing somewhere else. And it's this blending of identity. It's sort of tapping into what spiritual experiences might look like. It's a very, uh, the whole thing, yeah, I, I think we're finally at a point where we can have these conversations and people don't think you're absolutely insane. Uh, yeah, this was all this, the crazy, fringy stuff that, you know, 10 years ago we talk about. It's just like conspiracy theory nonsense. And now every, I mean, literally at this point, now with these agents at work, there are humongous updates. I know a lot of people are following this, but if you're not, uh, there are humongous updates in the abilities of these AIs about every 24 hours now. Because you have an unlimited amount of AI agents all working and spawning more AI to solve problems. Uh, and it's really, it's, 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 there's starting to be just a slight bit of panic on my end about the oh, singularity, man. It's all, you know, slow and then boom, it goes straight up the curve. So, yeah, it's, it's really uh, crazy. Yeah. So, um, okay. Well, I got sort of a related story here that we can talk about, uh, a little bit different, but, you know, we're talking about the beast system. We Speaking might well of the beast system, beast, 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 beast system, jump into it. This has been uh, a story that's sort of been developing for about a week. Um, old school Canary Cry listeners will recognize this one, uh, but it's getting taken to the next level in the mainstream media. Uh, This is coming from Wired.com, and the headline is Artificial Wombs Will Change Abortion Rights Forever. So we've talked about artificial wombs. We have talked about them for many, many years uh, and the research going into them and what does that mean for humanity in the context of transhumanism and the image of God and all these sorts of things. But this is Wired, so mainstream big outlet. Uh, And of course, surprise, surprise, putting it in the context of a social issue, in this case, abortion and abortion rights. Uh, Let me give you the little summary here at the top. One day, human wombs may no longer be necessary for bearing children. In 2016, a research team in Cambridge, England, grew human embryos in ectogenesis, the process of human or animal gestation in an artificial environment, for up to 13 days after fertilization. A further breakthrough came the next year when the researchers at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia announced that they had developed a basic artificial uterus named Biobag. The bio bag 
the sustained lamb fetuses equivalent in size and development to a human fetus at roughly 22 weeks gestation to full term successfully. Then, in August of 2022, researchers at the Wiseman Institute of Science in Israel created the world's first synthetic embryos from mice stem cells. In the same month, scientists at the University of Cambridge used stem cells to create a synthetic embryo with a brain and a beating heart. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, which is full scale. Ectogenesis has the potential to transform reproductive labor and reduce risks associated with reproduction. Hey, that sounds like good news, Gons. Reducing reproductive labor, labor and risks associated with reproduction. It could enable people with wombs. Hello, people with wombs. <laughs> to reproduce as easily as cisgender men do uh. without risks to their physical health, their economic safety, or their bodily autonomy. Mm -hmm. uh, just listen to the, the way that they're talking about it. <laughs> they're, <Yeah. laughs> they're, first of all, they're making a statement that men can reproduce without risks to their physical health, their economic safety, or their bodily autonomy. I don't think that's quite the most objective way to consider men's roles in reproduction. I see what they're going for, but uh, come on. Uh, but they're saying, even if you have a womb, you can be so carefree and safe like a man. By removing natural gestation from the process of having children, ectogenesis could offer an equal starting point for people of all sexes and genders, Equity. all of them particularly for queer people who wish to have children without having to rely on the morally ambiguous option of surrogacy. Why is surrogacy morally ambiguous? Because it's, it's playing into the duality of gender. Can't have yeah. that. A, a woman having a baby it, is no. morally no. ambiguous. <laughs> no, can't yeah. do it. Sorry. Womb haver, womb, a womb, womb haver, womb person, womb haver, <laughs> a womb haver, wombing <laughs> is morally ambiguous. Apparently, uh, if safe and effective ectogenesis were made accessible as opposed to being privatized, which risks further entrenching social and economic inequalities, the technology could result in a more prosperous and more equal society. Oh, yes. Yet. Development of ectogenesis could also wreak havoc on the hard-fought right of women and people with wombs, <laughs> women and people with wombs, to access safe and legal abortion. Oh. And could significantly weaken abortion policies worldwide. Hey, you, Republicans is, win, baby. Republicans win. Roll out them artificial wombs that save some babies. So you're seeing the issue, aren't you? Yeah. There is this weird, I mean, there is a weird train of thought here that feels like it's a, a trap. A, a, which, Waka, Wachowski film or whatever. What are the, what's the Matrix directors? I forgot uh, the name. Yeah, the Wachowski, Wachowskis, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I think it's that. Yeah, It's like a Wachowski sci-fi, futuristic, philosophical nonsense film, but it's in Wired. So you got what they were laying out. They're saying, okay, if this ability to grow babies in a, in a tube becomes so safe, effective, and available, it could put abortion rights at risk. <laughs> this is, I, I, th this they place don't know how to feel about this. Well, I, yeah, I know. It's kind of interesting because, it, yeah, it does sort of allow for certain things pr previously limited by biology <laughs> and kind of break through those barriers, but at the expense of maybe letting go of the abortion debate. You know, But it's it, this has been something that I've talked about a lot as warning people who lean right, conservative, you know, people that are uh, defend, you know, people that are rage against child trafficking, for example. That was the one big topic that i used as an example is okay yes we are all against child trafficking i agree we should take down the cabal or whatever is doing all that stuff but then what if they come out and say well we need to identify every child we need we need 
DNA. We need to make sure their DNA is, you know, official in the eyes of whatever institution so that they're accounted for, which is part of the right. UN 2030 agenda. Yeah. And then you're kind of like, oh, well, that's not exactly, but that's, oh, you wanted a solution. So there you go. And this is sort of the same thing. It's like, well, you think uh, killing babies in the womb is uh, bad. It's immoral. Well, hey, we don't have to kill them anymore. We just take them out, we'll put them in the uh, artificial uh, the womb. Right. And there you go. Yeah. You got yourself your so cyber baby. And it's kind of, uh, well, that's not exactly what we want. You know, so it's a very interesting uh, bait and switch. Yeah. Yeah. That they're, lo that they are uh, sort of, I, I don't know, exploring in this article is if it became so widely available that uh, it made no sense to abort fetuses, abort mm -hmm. babies, that, yeah. that if, if eliminating a pregnancy were as simple as, you know, a little tube takes the, even if it's just an embryo or however big or small it is, it, it just gets uh, removed and put in a tube. Sure, maybe the, the person or the parents, they are absolved of any responsibility. That embryo then becomes a ward of the state and gets put into, uh, you know, the artificial womb uh, repository and and uh, grows the the baby from uh, whatever embryo to full term uh, there would be no reason you can t t totally erase the moral aspect of abortion wow. because you can ban abortion yeah, there's no you know the fight is over and all yeah. you got to do is agree to grow all these babies who would have been aborted but now they're just going to be test tube babies. What's They're going to the, grow up in an artificial womb. What's the outlet here again? Wired. Wired. Okay. So, yeah, pretty pretty left leaning outlet. But here's listen to this: successful ectogenesis or genesis would render the fetus viable at a very early stage, possibly even from conception. If ectogenesis, even partial ectogenesis, become available, it would then be possible for an unwanted fetus to be transferred into an artificial womb to continue developing without harming a woman's body's autonomy depending on how the fetus is removed. In this way, women would be able to end their pregnancy without resorting to traditional abortion. Given this option, if a woman chooses traditional abortion regardless, the abortion will appear more like an intentional killing. Exactly. Wow. I mean, abortion, <laughs> I, and they say it right there. They say that it. Without this technology, they are admitting that abortion is murder. If, if you had the option to take the the fetus out of the woman and grow it in an artificial womb, they admit then an abortion is murder. You know, and they talk in this article so much about balance. They talk yeah. about uh, in an effort to strike a balance between woman's bodily autonomy and the fetus's moral status. All this this balancing of interests, this balancing of ethics, so much balance, and uh, they. It, it, the artificial womb technology completely sort of erases the need to find a balance because there's no reason for abortion if the child can be put in an artificial womb. And you can see if you place yourself in the future and you kind of <clears throat> think back, uh, let's say, let's, you know, place ourselves uh, 40 years into the future. And 40 years from now, you look back and you're like, wow, remember when abortion was such a big deal? Uh, I mean, they were arguing about it. There was laws, there's protests, there's fights, there was this, there was that. It was such a big deal. Uh, and she, they used to just, if they didn't want a baby, they couldn't just deposit it in the state's unwanted baby repository where they were grown and given a life. No, they would just kill them. How barbaric. I mean, the idea that abortion is sort of a barbaric practice that would be frowned upon from future generations. This is that situation. It is under this context that is pretty much here. Just a matter of making it available and a little bit more perfection of the technology. But you could easily see this coming in the next couple of years, especially if somebody puts, uh, you know, AI on the job of solving the problems. Uh, but it, it it really is sort of a 
historical paradigm shift that's right in front of our, in front of our faces and the you know on one hand you can say wow that's incredible it totally gets rid of abortion and all the only price you got to pay is growing babies outside of a human body becomes so normalized and so accessible uh, and it really puts the discerning sort of spiritual individual at quite the impasse, if you ask me. Yeah, they do conclude, however, for women's reproductive rights to be assured, abortion must remain an available option even after ectogenesis becomes reality. So, you know, they do I'd that thing. It. They do that thing yeah, yeah. with uh, with these articles where they, they give you the, the, the spiel, right? Where they're like, ah, oh, we, we see it. We, we're stuck. And then they kind of just like double down on their original thesis. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> By no to means is Wired them. actually coming to yeah, like yeah, yeah. A, a reasonable conclusion. There, and I mean, even in the way they say it, they say literally like, "Yeah, well, you know, you just got to be fair, so you still got to let them kill babies. You know, <laughs> you can't not let them kill babies. That's just women's rights." Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's crazy. complicated. Crazy, yeah. crazy, crazy. Which, which reveals you know, how deeply entrenched the idea of abortion is right now, whereas even in the case where they could totally solve any need for the existence of abortion, they're kind of like, yeah, well, women's rights, you got to let them do what they want to do. You well, know? yeah, but, because but, it's, but, it's not just, well, obviously women's rights is the narrative, but it has to do likely with, uh, you know, some money too. You know, there's certain practices that, uh, exist solely on the basis of oh, yeah. doing Full abortion. Industries. So, yeah. Well, and it gets into this topic of, well, uh, this last one here, future legislation will need to guarantee that ectogenesis is a choice rather than a new form of coercion. <laughs> so coercion to not kill the baby would be coercion. The right to abortion will need to be recentered in law around the value of reproductive autonomy. Uh -huh. and the right not to become a biological parent against one's will, as opposed to fetus viability. As the, so they are literally saying, my or one's autonomy to just choose to not be a parent would be the right to destroy a viable fetus that in all circumstance could make it to to gestation could be born but it's simply the choice that someone doesn't want to be a biological parent even if they're not responsible for the child or anything it's it's this hyper hyper autonomous individuality where you don't have any consequences to suffer for your choices. You know, it's not just, oh, I want to protect my body. I don't want the financial risk. I don't, I just don't want to be a parent. I don't want to raise a kid. You know, that's one level of it. But in this case where the possibility would be none of you, it wouldn't hurt your body, wouldn't be responsible, wouldn't have to raise a child, nothing. It would simply be the autonomy of not having the right to kill a baby. <laughs> As this legal debate gains the attention of politicians, legislators, community leaders, and the wider public, how much people and societies respect women's rights to choose will become more apparent than ever. Yeah, you're into, you know, it's, it's like they're trying to fit the concept of uh, ectogenesis into the current prevailing values. You know, they're taking for granted the value of, of women's rights to choose and, in, and superimposing those values on a future generation, which I guess happens all the time, but uh, it's really easy to see how and why uh, making such a... a called shot like this from wired can be a pretty uh i don't know bold thing to do kind of risky if you ask me yeah well it's interesting that the very thing that we talked about the absurd idea of you know two gay men 
creating a baby and and because i've heard that argument like well you can't you know it's an extinction thing and yes yeah, certainly until the technology catches up to be able to do it and that sounded a, a crazy to normal people for the last 10 years but now wired is considering the consequences of what that might do to their uh, whole social agenda there so interesting yeah, yeah. to say the least all right well mm. uh let's move on let's have a party real quick. Go to canarycry.party. Put it in your URL and hit enter. You'll find a tree of links that leads to everything from where to listen to the show, watch the show, how to produce the show, how to connect with us and the community. Yep, go check it out, folks. You can join the communities there. That's a really great thing to do. We have a Discord channel. We've got canarycry.community, all sorts of ways to get connected. Um, and, you know, those communities are really great. It's not just, you know, talking about the show, talking about crazy stuff. These are people who are um, becoming really good friends. There's uh, all sorts of aspects to the social communities of Canarians out there. I recommend checking it out. Uh, and with that, guns, let's thank some producers. It's break time! Come on, take a break, folks. Yeah, we're going to thank some producers who uh, produced the show financially. We really appreciate their participation in the value for value model. Again, it's more than just uh, a way to keep a podcast going. It's a paradigm shift in how we perceive independent media and the value of keeping it separate from corporate interests. And it's only possible uh, if people participate in value for value with their time, their talent, or their treasure. We got some people to thank. Uh, as far as I can tell, we did not have an executive producer come in for today's show. Uh, so we'll just get right down to business and thank some of our other producers. You Are you ready for such a thing? I am ready. Kind of sad, okay. but yeah, ready. Ah, yeah, yeah, you know, it happens every once in a while. Every while, yeah. Is these poor, poor episodes that have no executive producers born to, to grow up without a mommy or a daddy. Uh, okay, here we go. Starting out with uh, producer Jacob B. is back on a three-episode streak. Jacob B., thank you. Three. They're heating up. He's heating up. That's right. Comes in for 11-11. Hey. 11 just a reminder, Jacob B. is the one asking for Nephilim Penguin artwork. I have not seen any Nephilim Penguin artwork yet. Hello? Mm. We got a Nephilim Penguin tattoo design contest here. Uh, create an idea. Even if it's just an idea. Maybe you don't have a sketch. You have an idea. Uh, you can send it to Nephilim Penguin Tattoo at Yahoo.com or Nephilim or Canary Cry Radio at gmail.com. <laughs> uh, Jacob sent a note here. It says, got a question on the round table, fellas. Does supply dropping count toward one's initiation into night or damehood? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, any... You know, monthly producership, it all counts. Uh, but you, uh, you know, track it yourself. So depending on how long you've been in the uh, supply drop, let's see here. Do we know, do we remember the math on supply, how many months it takes for its supply droppers uh, to get night or damehood if that's all they do? Uh, do you remember? No, no, I can yeah, do it real quick. A thousand it's about divided 30. by 33. 30, 30 months, so... 30 months, a couple years. Two and a half years, yeah. Two and a half years, yeah. So if one only does supply drop for two and a half years, they will become a knight or a dame. Uh, so there you go, Jacob B. Yes, any any financial producer should towards that. So uh, if you think you're close, anybody out there, just go get your records, do your own accounting. It's kind of the honor system. Uh, send it to us, and we'd be happy to do a knighting and or a daming for you. Thank you, Jacob B. Thank you, Jacob B. Next up, we've got producer Jeremy M. Jeremy M. Jeremy Thank M. You. comes in with a nice round number, uh, joins uh, monthly. Thank you very much, hey, Jeremy thank M. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next up, we got producer Morgan E. is back on a 16-episode streak. Morgan E. 
Yep, nice round number. Appreciate that. Next up, we got Sir Morv, Night of the Burning Chariots, coming in for 11 11, 216 episodes in a row. 11 11. Oh, yeah. delicious. Straight delicious indeed. Thank, Thank you, you, Sir Morv. Morv. Next up, we got uh, producer Isaac G. Five episodes in a row. Comes in with a pocket full of sevens. Hey, Isaac G., thank you. Uh, we got Sir Alex Protocol, V2, Night of the Brian Protocol. Pocket full of sevens, 158 episodes in a row. Thank you very much. Oh. Uh, we've got Dane Gale, Canary Whisper, and Lady of X's and O's came in for a pocket full of sevens, 246 episodes in a row. Oh, 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 oh yeah! Streak delicious. Women rule! Thank you, Dane Gale. Got a, got a note here. It says, hello, my sweets. Urgent prayer needed. Okay. At 15, my daughter Kerrigan had an ovarian mass removed. Ooh. We just found out it's re- reoccurring on the 25% of the saved ovary from the first surgery and involves the fallopian tube. Please pray that it isn't malignant X's and O's. Okay, time to call upon the Prey Deucers, guys. Prey Deucers, assemble! That's right, producers around the world, people listening live and later on, they are all producers, uh, people who are committed to praying for the show, for the producers of the show, all that kind of stuff. We are putting uh, Kerrigan, Dame Gale's daughter Kerrigan, on the list regarding a uh, recurring growth on the uh, ovary and fallopian tubes. So, yeah. of course, we're going to be praying for good news from the doctor, supernatural healing. We're going to be praying for strength and comfort for everybody throughout the process. Put it on the list, folks, and add it to your prayers for care again. Thank you very much, Dame Gale. Thank you, Dame Gale. Appreciate it. Sorry, So yeah. sorry to hear about to that, hear. but yeah. we're praying and believing. Yep. Okay, that concludes the list of financial producers who came in uh, above the 777 cutoff. We got some people under that amount. We'll thank them now. Okay. Starting with Sir Casey the Shield Knight, 284 episodes in a row. Thank you, Sir Casey. Veronica D, 246 episodes in a row. Veronica D, thank you. Doctor Who Done That, 47 episodes in a row. Doctor Who Done That, thank you very much. Sir Scott Knight of Truth, 273 episodes in a row. Thank you. Sir Scott, Night of Truth. Here we go. They, those it? are the ones. Yep. Okie dokie that they all receive this. Oh, 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 yeah! Streak delicious. Women rule. Now, mm-hmm. Basil, do you want to thank our producers who came in with their talent? Yeah, now? you know, I think we should just combine the breaks. It's the producers are so few and far between this episode. I think we can just get everything done in one foul swoop. Okay, well, let's do a little speak pipe real quick. Here. Okay. Please leave a message after the tone, 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 tone. At the tone, please record your message. Leave a message. Beep. Message. Go to canarycrynewstalk.com. Look for a green tab on the right side or the bottom of the page. Click on it, and it will give you a little window that allows you to record a audio message of up to 90 seconds, and it will be sent to us, and we shall hear it. And uh, we got one from Rochelle. Happy Wednesday, Canarians. This is for my buddy Johnny in the queue. Thank you for the inspiration. This is at least part one of... Matthew 24. Upon my return, I am grieved. Do not be deceived. For in me you once believed. From a virgin I was conceived. Don't you see all of these things? God throws down temple buildings. Many come in my name. They bless me with their shame. Rumors of wars fill the air. But you're a wheat, not a tear. So do not let your heart feel trouble. 
Come under my protection bubble For in this life you will feel pain And in my name you will be slain Stay strong for Jesus. I'll be back with part two. Thank you, Rochelle. Try to pull Thank you very much, Rochelle. Guitar thing under it, but I don't know if it was in the right Look key. At you. Look at you go. A little, little ad lib. Yeah. Thank you very much, mm-hmm. Rochelle. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah, uh, remember, mm-hmm. uh, you can leave us a message, folks, by going to canarycrynewstalk.com. You'll see a green tab on the mm-hmm. bottom or the right-hand side. Click yeah. on that. You can leave us a message. Uh, and if you do that, you can also uh, leave us a prayer to play in the pre-show. Right. I saw some people were missing the prayers at the pre-show today. We didn't have any have any to play. So there you go. Go get on it, folks. Don't be afraid. Don't be shy. Come on now. Yep. Uh, okay, let's do art. One art, please. <laughs> and we have one art today from Sir Dove. One art, please, from Dove. And he's a note here. Peace for this week's thumbnail duo artwork. I did a remix of an old sticker design, this time with Gons shredding on the axe instead. Hope you guys like it. Keep doing what you do, and I'll keep praying for you, Inns. Yeah, this is great. This is uh, <laughs> a rendition of the... Basil and Gons uh, Wayne's Sloppy. World collection. Wayne's World. Yes, we've got Gons there uh, with his uh, with the white guitar. He's got his Gons World hat on, sitting on the couch. Nice ripped uh, jeans there. Of course, you got Basil wearing his Nephilim Penguins shirt. Got his drumsticks, his, his googly eye glasses on all wonky. And in this case, we've got the background of, uh, of Wayne's World the, from the movie. You know the one. It's very fun. This uh, We use this in the thumbnail today, baby. Appreciate it, Dove. Yep. Thank you, Dove. Appreciate it. Yeah, I like it. The uh, that That's a pretty metal guitar there. It's got the Floyd Rose. You know what the Floyd Rose is? Nope. It's the, uh, it's the, the locking system at the bottom. It, the bridge of your guitar mm-hmm. in the eighties, they came up with this thing called Floyd Rose, or maybe it was earlier than that. And it allows you to do these like dive bombs and all kinds of stuff with the, uh, tremolo bar there. So Fun. Uh, yeah, cool stuff. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Dove. appreciate it. I think that's the real background to Wayne's world there in the, in, in the, the background of the art. Yeah, it is. All right. We, uh, we also have a couple microfictions to go through here. Okay. Microfiction. Microfiction. And I believe this first one is from Rung Smash. They discuss the recent history of the real world. But then Mike remembers his friend, the chaplain. He is overcome with the urge to leave his strange mindscape, but he's forgotten why he even came. While he remembers, a towering mushroom grows. Hmm. Is that a, a nuke? Is that a dun, dun, dun. psilocybin? Could be. Can't tell. Could be. Could be either. You know, he's in the multi-dimensional psychedelic world. Who knows? Thank you very much, Runk Smash. Thank you, Runk Smash. We also have one from Stefan S. Based on Utah's social media laws, Buy My Tech launches a digital marketing campaign on TikTok, Instagram, and games directly to youth for their newly released free mobile app. Kids VPN, spelled with a Z. No talk of data collection is found in the ads. Uh, reality, I think, is uh, worse than the, than the microfiction here. <laughs> Doesn't even tap into how bad it is. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Thank you very much, Stefan S. Thank you, Stefan S. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you to all the producers coming in with their talent. It's where you can help us build the culture behind the community uh, here at Canary Cry Newstock. And so mm-hmm. you can go to canarycry.art, submit artwork there, uh, or if you got some, uh, well, well, yeah, mostly there, mostly canarycry.art. If you have any audio or 
uh, visual work that you'd like to share to help us build the community. There you go. Yeah. And if you have an article that you want us to cover on the show or take a look at, go to canarycry.report. Ah, yes. Fill that form out. That'll get that article right in front of our faces instead of getting it lost in the inbox there. Okay. Sounds good. Look at that. We're speeding right through it. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's continue. What are you saying? Yeah. Are we dropping YouTube for this? Or I mean, I feel like we've already I... said some things. <laughs> going to get us banned retroactively from YouTube on this episode. I don't think so. I, I mean, the RFK stuff is definitely... Yeah, that's true. You're right. Okay. It's going to get us kicked off for sure. Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll drop the Rumble link and drop the Rumble link uh, into the YouTube chat and stuff there because what follows is too hot for YouTube, folks. So uh, click that link. Head on over to our Rumble channel uh, to get the rest of the show. Appreciate you. Okay, here you go. We're waking up and we're going to say goodbye. Yes, it's wake up time. Hey, yo, wake up. I just keep muting. Bye, YouTube. 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 Twitter, Facebook, whatever it is, you can find all those links at canarycry.party as well. Bye. Too hot for YouTube. Bye, 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 bye. YouTube. Now you see me. Now you don't. It's Corona time. <laughs> Coronavirus!